Okay, so let's finish up talking about the books of history. Um, we talked about Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. That takes us to First and Second Samuel. Um, now, Joshua pretty much follows Deuteronomy. Judges pretty much is right after Joshua. And First and Second Samuel picks up at the tail end of the time of the Judges. Samuel is actually the last of the, of the Judges um, that God uh, uses before a king comes. Um, it was written by Samuel and his disciples. We know it wasn't fully written by Samuel, all of it, because Samuel dies in it. So... Obviously, it had to be been finished by someone else. Uh, it was written sometime in the in the thousands BC. Um, that's when the events happen, at least. Um, and First Samuel kind of talks about Samuel as the last judge, and talks about King Saul, um, and kind of King David's rise in the background. But then Second Samuel is is about um, King David. Um, so. Um, you see the people at the beginning of, of Samuel desiring for a king and asking for a king. And if you remember, God prophesied that there would be a king. Okay. However, they asked at the wrong time and for the wrong reasons. Um, it wasn't God's timing yet. Um, they wanted a king for protection first off, when that was supposed to have come from God, and for identity that they wanted to be associated like the other like the other kingdoms were. However, that was once again something that God was supposed to have given them. So. Uh, Samuel does his thing for a while, and then the people come to him and ask for a king. And so uh, he gets real discouraged, and, and he goes and, and anoints uh, a person named Saul to be the first king of Israel. Now, Saul never never gets all of the tribes of Israel to unite under him. Um, there's always a little bit of tension there, and, 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 and he never really gets um, conquers uh, the invading forces either, um, mostly due to his lack of obedience. In fact, I'm going to say entirely because of his uh, disobedience. And so God removes his anointing from him. Now, Saul was exactly what people wanted, the, the people of Israel wanted. So people always ask, well, couldn't have God just not have given them what they wanted and pick someone better? Yeah, he could have, but he gave Saul the choice. See, Saul hadn't messed up yet when, when God anointed him. So he gave him the choice as to whether to succeed or to fail, and Saul chose not to follow. Now, God knew that Saul was going to do that, but he still gave him the choice to do it. Um, and so he anointed, he, he anointed a king who, uh, who the people of Israel wanted. Um, and he reigns from about 1050, somewhere abouts, to about 1010 when he is killed in battle. Um, and David um, is, is the rising star. As, as Saul kind of drifts away from God, um, David has uh, God has David anointed um, as king. However, it's a long time before David becomes king. But David is what God wanted in a king. He sought after the Lord, and even though he messed up, he always he always sought God. Um, he w the Bible says that he was a man with a heart after God, um, and so he he kind of. It, is kind of he kind of ra uh, rises in popularity while Saul declines in popularity until finally, long story short, Saul dies in battle and David has to fight Saul's descendants um, and some other different things to establish the kingdom. But he establishes all of the kingdom under his uh, under his reign. Um, all, I mean all of the tribes under his kingdom, uh, and so he starts his reign at about 1010 10, somewhere abouts, and um, till about 971. And he, he we'll say in Samuel covers it, but he, he has a lot of different things that happen. I don't really want to get into it. Um, King Saul has an evil spirit that says, it, it, says, it says, came from God. And people always ask that. Like, that really, that really troubles them. Um, how could God have spent this, sent this evil spirit? So, um, first thing to note, it could have... Could, no, I'm not, I don't really want to get into that. But um, the evil spirit was given to Saul because... He was living in disobedience and bitterness and jealousy, okay? And so when God lifted his anointing from, from Saul, he gave it to David, which caused even more irritation to, to Saul. Um, and so this spirit, this evil spirit, the purpose of it was to punish Saul for disobeying God, but also to draw Saul to repentance. Um, God had been God had been patient with Saul and, and merciful, and he kept trying to bring these things, and Saul just kept stiffening his neck and doing whatever the heck he wanted. And so God brought, sent the Spirit to turn him from his sin. Um, remember, when, when you're reading the books of history, let God be God. Don't try to tell God what he should and shouldn't have done. Just 
understand the story, see how it applies to you. Um, so then, uh, eventually, King David has a son named Solomon, who get who becomes the wisest person because he actually asked for asked for wisdom from God, and God gave him wisdom. Um, he reigns from about 971 to 930. Now, whereas David united all of the tribes under under his kingdom, Solomon expanded it almost to to the state of an empire. It was really um, King Solomon was a very uh, let's just say successful king. Um, David tries to build a temple in his time to God because he's like, well, I have this really nice place I'm living in, and God doesn't have anywhere. God tells him, look, I don't need a house. I'm I'm bigger than all that, anyways. Um, and he's but he's, but then he says, you know what, I, I, your your son King Solomon, he's going to build a temple. So Solomon builds it builds him a temple. And uh, yeah, that's that. But that doesn't happen until uh, First Kings. Um, that doesn't happen in Second Samuel. Solomon is barely mentioned in Samuel. Um, so then here is just a picture here. On the right side, you can see the tribes, and I had to stretch the picture so it looks a little funny. Um, you can see the tribes and, and, and where they originally supposed to be at. Let me move this out of the way again. Um, you see right there. But then on the left side is how far it, it, it the kingdom got. Now, if you look at this darker coloration here, this is what Saul had. Not that big. But then David had all of this. And it goes way down here to the Red Sea. I mean, it's just this, this huge chunk of land. Um, and, and and Solomon made it where he's even more of a successful, successful thing. He had in, imports and exports. He had all this thing. Everybody knew about Solomon. And it was just, wow. Um, so, anyways. Um so then, um, after King Solomon, he at the end, towards the end of his life, he just kind of messes up and stops seeking the Lord and start, starts worshiping all these other gods and starts doing all kinds of different things that, that the, Deut the the book of Deuteronomy had, had already told kings not to do. Um, and so, as a result, his son, um, the the kingdom falls apart pretty much right at his son. There's a, there's a rebellion, and whereas his son still reigns, he reigns a very small part of Israel. Um, as compared to um, the rest, but anyways, so the it's uh, Israel is separated into two into two parts: the northern and the southern. The uh, northern kingdom is, is is called Israel, Samaria, and Ephraim, uh, different names like that. Um, whereas the southern kingdom is called Judah, Jerusalem, Zion. Um, and we'll talk about um, Mount Zion later, uh, but don't worry about that. <clears throat> so Israel, the, the kingdom splits in 930 at the end of King Solomon's uh, reign. Right here, if you look, um, he reigns till 930. But at the end of his reign, when his son becomes um, king, um, the, the kingdom splits. And so the northern kingdom uh, is a thing from 930 when it splits all the way to 722. However, um, a Syri the Syrian army comes in um, and conquers them. Uh, in 722, and it's it's not not a thing anymore. And uh, whereas the Southern Kingdom is around from 930 all the way down to 586, that's quite a bit longer. However, they fall to Babylon, who came and conquered Assyria, and then headed down and and conquered um, Israel eventually. Um, the Northern Kingdom didn't have any righteous kings. Out of all the kings and first and second kings mentioned from Israel, there's not a single one that's righteous. Whereas the, as the Southern Kingdom only had five, but still, that's five. Um, and in the Southern Kingdom, all the kings are descendants of David. They're all sons of David. Okay, um, and that's one of the one of the things um, is that David's David is, David's sons are still on the throne. Once again, pointing to Jesus um, and how he came from David. Now, First and Second Chronicles is going to cover Judah ex exclusively, um, so it's only going to going to cover uh, uh, David's descendants. And we'll talk about that when we get to First and Second Chronicles. Um, so when when the northern kingdom falls, though they're they're deported and, and exiled and everything, and they're replaced with Sumerians. Now, the, what Sumerians are are the different people groups. Uh, as Assyria conquered and Babylon too, they kind of moved people around. That way, they didn't they didn't rebel. They kind of lost their identity. They become part of the conglomerate of the of the empire as a whole. So uh, Assyria moves these other people in uh, into northern Israel, and these people become the Sumerians. Um, 
And um, if you know about um, the Samaritan, uh, the, the Samaritans, like Jesus told the, the parable about, this is where those people first came from. They, they kind of halfway accepted the, the Jewish traditions and, and they were kind of like mixed breed Jews, if you think about it. Um, I know that's kind of a, a vulgar way to say it, but I mean, it gets the point across. Um, and, however, the southern kingdom in 586 is exiled to Babylon, and that's what I'm talking about when I say the exile. So they're taken to, taken to Babylon. However, at, and during the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we're going to see how they come back. They're allowed to return to the promised land, um, the southern kingdom. Um, the northern kingdom was comprised of ten tribes, and the southern kingdom was only had two, uh, Judah and Benjamin. Now Judah is the tribe that Jesus was going to come from. Um, and so right here, we have what the breakup looked like. Here's Israel here. Here's Judah, the northern and the southern kingdom. Then right here is Philistia. That's where all the Philistines are. You can see how, how much of the land they had taken. Here's Edom down here, pretty big. Moab here. Ammon's over here. Amram is here. And Phoenicia is here. So Damascus, that's right here. Tyre and Sidon, that's right here. And Sidon is, hmm, I remember. Um, and I don't have it on that map. So which takes us to the events of First and Second Kings, which talks about um, Solomon reigning, and then it talks about his son taking over and how the empire is uh, falls apart. Um, so it was written sometime after Israel was exiled, uh, maybe by the prophet Jeremiah, um, but whoever wrote it, it had happened before 539, because in 539 Babylon is um, is taken over by Persia. And Persia allows them to return back to the Promised Land in Ezra and Nehemiah. So, um, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so, first and second kings, the purpose of it is to answer why Israel and Judah fell. If they were God's chosen people, why did they why did they fall to the invaders? Well, first and second kings, it, its purpose is to show that, um, and it it relates strongly with the book of Deuteronomy. It uh, really um, hints towards the book of Deuteronomy a lot. The 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 books of the law as a whole, but um, especially Deuteronomy. Um, so re read First and Second Kings through about the same time that you read Deuteronomy through, and you'll kind of see the the, the themes. Um, now I do want to mention First and Second Kings go to, to great lengths to show how how Israel's um, sin led to God's judgment. Now keep in mind that not every disaster is necessarily God's judgment. Some some of them are maybe okay. However. Um, not every disaster is God's judgment. Okay, God specifically told them, I'm going to do this if you don't do this. He told them that before they even entered the promised land. And then he did that because he held them to a higher standard because he gave them the law and they still didn't obey him. The other people, the, the Philistines, the, the Moabites, the Babylonians, they didn't have God's law. The Jews did. So God allowed them to be punished in a way. Um, and, and once again, God does did punish those who... who who um, mistreated Israel. However, um, not every disaster is necessarily God's judgment. So um, what we do see in First and Second Kings is uh, God being very patient, loving, merciful, just all around putting up with Israel's nonsense from all the way back in, in, in Exodus through Numbers and, and, and into Joshua and Judges, and then all the way down here, past the Samuel, into the books of First and Second Kings, they're still half-heartedly serving God, and He's still being patient. However, um, He does bring them to bring them to and bring them to punishment. But remember, Israel was not forgotten. God punished them, but He didn't forget them. So then it takes us to the books of First and Second Chronicles, which cover pretty much a lot of the same details um, that this, the books of Samuel and Kings have already done, but it does it from a very one-sided point of view. Um, and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, it, as far as who wrote it, it's anonymous, maybe Ezra or Nehemiah or both. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, it doesn't say who wrote it. Uh, and it was written probably sometime in the 40s or, or, or maybe um, late, I'm sorry, 400s or late 500s. Um, because it ends with Persia saying, yes, you can go back to the promised land. Um, and this is what I was talking about. So, uh, the books of Chronicles is a selective commentary. You know, it talks about genealogies to show them where they came from, to show the heritage of faith that they have. You know, but it, and, it, and it follows the kingdom of Judah, but it, it pretty much excludes the kingdom of Israel. And then it also um, 
kind of leaves out a lot of the bad stuff. Like King David had this affair with a woman named Bathsheba, and Chronicles completely leaves that out. It kind of just selectively chooses things to give the people hope and encourage them to trust in God, which would be perfect scenario if the people were turning back to the promised land. It would have been, it would have, it would fit perfectly. Um, however, this is all just speculation. Um, as far as the date, the date is speculation. Um, it only I already mentioned this. It only follows the kingdom of Judah, David's descendants. It doesn't fall. It doesn't keep up with what's going on in Israel. And then pretty much. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah pick up as soon as, as at, the, at the very end of Chronicles is exactly where, where Ezra picks up. The, the story doesn't really lapse that much. Um, I'm not saying they were written at the same time. They may have been, but the events happened uh, right after each other. Um, Ezra and Nehemiah it was, was seen as connected in Israelite thought and Jewish thought. And I, I very much so agree with that. I think that Ezra and Nehemiah should be seen as one unit, the same as Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy as one unit. Um, so it's written by um, Ezra and Nehemiah, and parts maybe by each. It's it's kind of vague. Nehemiah was probably written by Nehemiah, but um, solely. But Ezra may have been written by Ezra and Nehemiah. I don't know. Whatever. Um, sometimes in the sometime in the 400s is that's when Nehemiah and lived. Um, so that, um, and Nehemiah, you know, talks about himself in the first person, so probably he wrote it. Um, but what we see in Ezra and Nehemiah, let me kind of give you a heads up of what happens. The, the Israel has fallen, and then, uh, you know, over a hundred years later, Judah falls to Babylon. And so Babylon, um, exiles them to, to, to Babylon, the city of Babylon, and, and they're living there. But then Babylon is conquered by Persia. Now, Persia conquers them in 539, okay, and pretty much says, hey, you guys can go back home. And so in 538, they do, and that's where, where Ezra picks up at, with them going back home. And, but they don't go all at once. They go in um, at least three immigrations. Um, I guess you could say migrations. I don't know what you'd say. Um, and uh, so that's what's happening in, in, in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But remember, um, the city... Of Jerusalem, it, it, which is their capital, their big thing, um, it's in ruins, and so Ezra and Nehemiah is is them rebuilding it. They rebuild the temple, then they rebuild the city and the walls. Um, but anyways, and there's this person named Joshua that goes with them. Okay, and Joshua foreshadows Jesus as a, as a general as a general principle. Both Joshuas that we've talked about in the books of history. Uh, point towards Jesus coming. And the first one was in the book of Joshua. He led the people into the promised land the same way Jesus leads us to the to, to heaven. He, he's the way to the Father. But then also in Ezra and Nehemiah, there's a guy named Joshua um, who also point, foreshadows Jesus and that he leads the people back to the promised land. Um, and also, I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus is... the. Jesus is Joshua in um, Greek. Wait, yeah. Um, Joshua and Jesus, is, it's the same name, it's just in two different languages. Hey, Joshua is Hebrew, actually. Um, how would you pronounce it? Um, Ye Yeshua, uh, I believe is how you would pronounce it in Hebrew. Um, but anyways, um, and yeah. So in the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, there's there's these this intermarriage going on, um, where um, the the Israelites are marrying outsiders, people who are not of Israelite descent, and um, this is a bad thing in the book, and and so they repent and everything, and so people have thought, oh, um, it, it was all about racial uh, maintaining racial purity that. Um, you know, it was like uh, they were trying. The other races were maybe less worthy or whatever. It's it's not like that, um, as far as we can tell. Um, what the intermarriage? Why God had a problem with intermarriage was because it was causing the people to adopt the pagan ideas, the the, the false gods. It was causing them to, and this this God warned them about this way back in the day. He said, "Now watch out! Don't let these don't let these people." persuade you to worship their gods worship me and me only don't 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 marry them don't intermarry with them where you're gonna where you're gonna adopt because you're gonna adopt their beliefs so you need to abstain from these things and so that's what Ezra and Nehemiah is talking about the people had, had just barely come back to the promised land and already they're um 
they're not standing firm in, in worshiping God. And so that's why it was such a big deal in Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, so as far as the events of what's going on during the books, it gets a little bit confused, confusing because Ezra picks up in the first immigration, and then it's years before um, before uh, Ezra is actually there. I mean, it's years later when Ezra is there. Um, but during the book of Ezra, it, um, chapter four, it kind of says all these different complaints that the people that the well, I'll get to it in just a second. Um, so Cyrus II conquers um, conquers Babylon, and this is when the Persian Empire is starts uh, starts. And he start he um, excuse me he sends out a proclamation in 539 that says you guys you guys can go home. Okay, um, don't pay attention to that error on the date there. Um, uh, actually, there isn't an error. Sorry. Um, and so the people leave pretty much right after that. The first immigration. This is where Ezra picks up at. But then it's much later when Ezra is actually there. Um, there's a little bit of a time lapse. Um, and the restoration of the temple, they go there and they start rebuilding the temple first off. And this is about 538. However, the people, remember the Sumerians, okay? They come and they say, look, can we help? Because they've, they've, they've halfway adopted Jewishness and they're just kind of the interbreeds over there. Um, the mixed breeds, whatever. Um, and Israel says, no, we're going to build this because this is our God. You don't have anything to do with this. And the Samaritan, uh, Samarians get upset. And so they have this long-standing feud. And so they start they start uh, trying to uh, discourage Israel from building. And then they even write letters to some of the kings um, of Persia to get them to stop. And then eventually um, they build their own temple and the Israelites go and destroy their temple, which is you know, once again, things are really um, at a head between the Israelites and the Samaritans. They hate each other by the time of Jesus. So if you read the parable of the Good Samaritan, you understand why the Israelites would have been like, these people are evil. Um, so anyways, um, so then uh, Cyrus II dies and and Cambyses II rules from 529 to 522, relatively short. He's not mentioned in Ezra or Nehemiah, so he's not really a big deal. Um, but then this guy right here, um, Darius the first, he comes to reign in 522 and he reigns till 486. Now, in chapter four of Ezra, um, it starts going off on this thing and it talks about about um, the Israelites, uh, the Sumerians opposing the Israelites. Okay, and then it goes on and says how um, the king demanded that um, the work stop, and then it says, and then uh, in the reign of Darius, the temple. Um, was finally uh, be began, or was they finally finished the the temple in, in the reign of Darius, um, and so this is what this is what Ezra does. Ezra does okay. First off, he he mentions this this opposition right here, um, uh, when they're restoring the temple, the Sumerian opposition. But then he hops down to Xerxes the first. Let me move my webcam out of the way here. He hops down to Xerxes the first, also called Ahasuerus, who reigns from 46 to 465, and mentions how the Sumerians sent an accusation about Israel to him. And then he hops down, and once again, and this is Ezra chapter four, to Artaxerxes the first, and how the Sumerians again complain to Artaxerxes, and he tells them, "Stop building what you're building." Okay, and then. Then after this, Ezra chapter four goes back to Darius and says, "So they stopped building the temple, and they didn't they didn't resume it until the reign of Darius." So you're like, "Wait, how you're at Artaxerxes, and now you're talking about Darius again?" This is what Ezra does. He talks about this opposition here, and the Israelites got so discouraged that they stopped building. So then they don't finish building until this guy um, uh, come, becomes king of Persia, Darius the first, and then they finish finish building the temple. However, he, for whatever reason, Ezra decides to also include um, the Sumerian opposition that they sent to Xerxes and Artaxerxes in the same part as the opposition that they gave back here. Now, why Ezra does that, I don't know. But just understand that in uh, when you get to Ezra chapter 4, the complaints are filed like this. Talks about their, uh, them opposing them here. Talks about 
um, their accusation for, uh, to Xerxes and then their, their complaint to Artaxerxes and the work stopping. And then he opts back down here and talks and says, and the temple wasn't resumed until Darius the first. So just in case I didn't make myself clear, um, this is how this is uh, regard uh, Ezra says it out of out of time frame, and this is how it actually happens. The people start building the temple. The Sumerians offer to help. The Jews say no, you cannot. So they get their feelings hurt and they say, okay, we're going to start opposing you now. And the Jews get very discouraged, so they stop building it. But then two prophets come by, and during the reign of Darius the first, um, they are encouraged and they and they resume their, the, the 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 temple and they finish it in five sixteen. Then. Later on, um, during the reign of Xerxes the uh, first, also called Ahasuerus, um, the Sumerians again um, accuse they, they accuse the Israelites of things to to, to Ahasuerus, and that doesn't really, nothing really happens about that. But then, when Artaxerxes the first is king, the Sumerians uh, file a complaint, and he says, "Okay, that's it. Work stops." And then, work does not progress on the wall or the city. Until um, uh, the book of Nehemiah starts, and Nehemiah starts with with saying saying about how he got this. Uh, Nehemiah gets this bad report about how the city is going, and Artaxerxes asks him, uh, Nehemiah, you know, hey, what's going on? And he says, you know, my, my city is in shambles. And so Artaxerxes then says, okay, you guys can go ahead and build. Um, so the second immigration, okay, the first immigration was in 538. Um, and the temple was finished in 516. And all this stuff is going on with with, with, with um, these different uh, complaints and everything. So during the reign of Artaxerxes, um, there's a second immigration that happens. Um, so the second group of people uh, it, of Israelites go to the back to the Promised Land. Um, so, okay. There we go, yeah. So Artaxerxes... Um, Artaxerxes becomes the king of Persia in 465. In 458, a second group of Israelites go back to the Promised Land, where the first group has already been. But then, some, sometime around there, um, the work stops because of a complaint that Artaxerxes gets. So then Nehemiah picks up, and, and, he, and he tells Artaxerxes about this, and so he says, okay, you can go ahead and go. And so then Nehemiah goes at about 445, and um, the wall and the, the, the city is finished. Um, so yeah. And all, why was this a such, a such a big deal? Because it showed... The, the Jerusalem was a symbol of God's presence with them. It was a symbol of, of, of God's, God's promise coming to fruition. Um, it, was, it was a big deal for them. Um, so that takes us to the book of Esther. Now Esther, it, it, anonymous author, but it happens sometime during Ezra and Nehemiah. Sometime in there. Uh, and there's a there's a third immigration that goes too, if I remember correctly, but that's not really important for what we're talking about. Um, as far as when it happened, that means it happened sometime in the 400s. Um, I don't know when it was written, but that's when the events happened. Um, and Esther doesn't really mention God, but it it does in an indirect way. We see God in the details, so it's just chance that Esther is chosen. It's just chance that all this stuff happens? No. Esther points to the way that God guides something without specifically mentioning God. Um, so what happens in the book of Esther? Um, the king gets irritated with his wife. And so he, 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 goes for, he, he searches for another queen. He finds a, a Jewish woman named Esther and marries her. Now... Um, uh, there's this guy that works for the king who wants to kill all the Jews. It's a long story, but you can read it in Esther. And uh, so Esther um, tells the king about it, and um, and the guy who's trying to kill the Jews dies. Um, I'm really oversimplifying the story, but that's that's the most important details, I guess. Um, but read through the book of Esther. It's a great book. Um, um, but it's important to note a few things about the Old Testament because we've gotten to the end of the events of the Old Testament. We're going to talk about the prophets in the next lesson, but but for right now, we're just talking about the actual historical progression here. And with Esther, with Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, historically, nothing really happens in far as way of um, books of history. The next historical book that comes is Matthew. 
which isn't really, we'll talk about that when we get to the Gospels, but um, besides that, there's just the prophets. Um, and with this, I want to say something. You know, oftentimes people think that the Bible is sexist. It's very much not sexist. The Bible was written during a sexist society. However, it is not sexist itself. We see frequently women being the hero of events. Moses' sister Miriam leads the people in, 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 in songs of worship to God. Uh, uh, Esther saves all of the Jews. Uh, a, a, a woman named Deborah is the judge who is mentioned first in, in, in the order. Um, if I remember correctly, um, all these all these different things where women are actually key players throughout the Bible and they do very important things. Um, but once again, the Bible was written dear in a culture that see what I mean. You can't exp you can't hold the Bible in modern day standards. The Bible wasn't written in the modern day; it was written back then. So you have to understand it as as it was written back then. You have to understand it in the culture that it was written to. So then after this. Um, after the prophets, there's there's a time of 400 years of silence, which basically says no new revelation from God until Jesus. It's just 400 years of waiting. Um, and I talked about this in the in the history lesson, the second lesson I think it was, where we talked about the Maccabean revolt and all that stuff. Um, so if there's any questions, post it below. Um, I'm not trying to summate the book or to really go in depth on the book. I encourage you to read through the books yourself. If you've already read through the Bible, do it again. The Bible is a book that should be repeatedly read. Um, so I'm not trying to trying to um, re study the book for you. I want you to study the book. I'm just trying to give you an overlay of what's happening in the book. Um, if there's any questions, please post them below, and I will do my very best to answer the best I can. Um, and uh, thank you very much for watching. Next video, we will talk about the...